thanks uh, for having me. This is, it's really exciting to be here, and it's very exciting also to uh, be part of this conference. Dr. Hoffman should be congratulated. There's so many people here from all over the world, and that's uh, really a testament to all the work that he's done. Um, my uh, talk today is on simulation, and um, it's always a little bit of a challenge because um, I, I am uh, <laughs> always a little uh, nervous when I pick some products and, and don't present all the products. So I just want to have a disclosure here that I'm going to talk about certain products because I have had exposure to them. But of course, there's many, many products in this field and uh, many products in this, um, uh, sorry, hold on, let me pull this up. Uh, many products in this sphere that are, um, are amazing. And so uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we have uh, time to do all that. I am not paid by any of these companies, and I don't have any, um, any uh, disclosures to make. However, I do have one disclosure to make in that I am probably the last person in the United States using this phone, and so I always think it's a little bit funny that I'm the person who's uh, talking about technology. Um, you know, I think if I hang on to this phone long enough, as many of you know from the news, I will probably become the CEO this week, so that's very exciting. Um, so. The, the next thing I want to just talk about is um, the usual way that people think about classroom learning is I, a lot of people have talked about this already is as a uh, didactic exchange between an expert and people listening in the audience of information. And I think what's happened in medical education and also in education in general is now we ha um, basically have put uh, computers and technology in uh, people's hands. And so we've changed the dynamic in that now people are using technology in the classroom, but that's probably not enough. And that just to use technology and to place it in the hands of the students as they're get, having an exchange of information is not using that technology to its fullest and also probably not using it in any way that has changed the paradigm of learning. Um, I, again, am in Boston, and um, we basically have um, talked about how to change this paradigm in medical education for years. And in 1989, there was a, a change that was called the New Pathway Cur Curriculum. And what they did was they wanted to take the didactic portion and the experiential portion of medical education and combine them. And so basically make the, from the very beginning, from the time when you come to the medical school, you are now in a problem-based small group session. You have interactions where you integrate both the clinical and the physio physiology and the histology and the pathology. You integrate that all together. And then you uh, can have small groups where you have exposure to mentors and educators at a, at a very early level. And what they found when they did this was that they um, generated more primary care physicians, so more people in this New Pathways curriculum uh, chose primary care. And what the theory behind this was because of the humanism and because of sort of the interaction between all the small groups and the mentors that you generated more humanists. Um, obviously, what happens uh, with this is that... Oops. Uh, you have to um, evolve this over time. And so what happens is, over time, this cu curriculum now has changed. And I think what people were worried about is a little bit what was talked about in the previous lecture, is that now some of this curriculum is now becoming uh, too centered on the humanists, and we've lost some of the science. And so what people wanted to do was bring the longitudinal from the, bed, from the bench to the bedside kind of approach, but keep that small group, keep that small uh, mentored uh, application so that people could understand the science and understand the clinical applications, but not lose that mentorship and humanist approach to teaching. So um, what that does, uh, what does that mean about ultrasound? So why, why is this applicable to ultrasound, and why does this kind of education reform that has happened in the United States, why does that have anything to do with what we're talking about in ultrasound? And what I think um, the interesting thing is, is that the ultrasound technology kind of perfectly matches the reform goals of that, of that effort. It is a problem-based approach to, to physiology and to science. Um, it's longitudinal in that you can take technology and you take it from the bedside to the clinical applications where you're making decisions on patients and diagnostic applications. It's integrated in that you're using all of the different um, history, physical exam findings, as well as diagnostic imaging to make decisions. And I think one of the things that's really underestimated in terms of ultrasound is the mentoring that happens. Many of you have the experience, will have this experience 
today is that the way ultrasound is taught is at the bedside with an expert and a small group of students interacting around a case. And I think that's what really lends itself to this new um, approach to medical education and that it's perfectly suited to that same paradigm. And of course it's technology and as was mentioned before, everything uh, now is kind of uh, technologically um, uh, appreciated and so every, anything technology students automatically love. Um, okay. And why is that important? I think the other way, reason that's important is because you'll have um, two, two types of learning that happen here. You have the anatomy and physiology, which has been discussed before, which is where the ultrasound can demonstrate the organs. You can teach the physiology as it goes along. And then you also have the um, uh, pathophysiology and the clinical decision making, which is kind of the higher order um, integration of those findings. And I think ultrasound perfectly mirrors that effort in education reform um, in terms of, of those uh, five characteristics. Okay, so um, is, uh, what do we do with this and is, how, how are we using this sort of in the technological sphere and what kind of um, products are out there? So one of them uh, is here today, and it's, uh, CAE was one of the first to develop a simulator that really took advantage of not only just the ultrasound images and having people practice and use their skills to do TEE and other um, sort of uh, physical um, skills, but also took the technology and the programming so that the ultrasound anatomy was explained with digital anatomy side by side. And I think that's really helpful because a lot of the ultrasound anatomy um, can sometimes be confused and sometimes be very complicated for, uh, for students. And so having these side-by-side -side, um, uh, uh, images can help people understand how things are working, what the planes are, what you're looking at. And this is something that kind of broke open the simulation um, field for ultrasound, I think. Um, there are other, whoops, there are other products. Obviously, Metaphor is another one. This is a transvaginal simulator. Again, same idea in that they have the, um, the probe and they have the ultrasound image, but side by side with that, they have a digital um, anatomy. You can see in 3D space where the plane is, where the probe is supposed to go, how the different planes and cuts are being uh, formed. And the other thing is a lot of these uh, softwares can, uh, can also do um, assessments. And so not only can you test um, whether, whether the probe is too, too deep or too, the pressure is right, but you can test whether the student can find certain objects, they can find certain p um, uh, structures, and if they can identify them correctly. And so again, I think the software here has just exploded and become much more sophisticated in the last three to five years, and there's a lot of excitement around this. Um, Another product is called Sonosim. Again, many of you may have seen this. Um, this, I think, is really exciting because it's a virtual probe. And so what happens is you have the virtual probe connected to a computer that has software. Um, similar to the other products that I mentioned, has uh, sort of the digital explanation next to the real ultrasound image. But the thing that's interesting here is, of course, this is a laptop. So you can bring this to any place um, and do any of the uh, imaging that you need to, and I think their marketing is really smart. This is how they um, kind of advertise this. You can go to the beach and learn ultrasound um, while you're, you know, practicing in the sun. But I think the, the cool thing about all of these is just that you can build cases within them that make decision making, um, easy, uh, testing ab ab ability available, and also can explain the anatomy side by side with the, the um, real ultrasound images. Sorry, this is, um, okay. So um, ultrasound simulators, I think, uh, have come a long way. Um, and I think uh, instead of just being a kind of practice using the probe, you can do image recognition uh, software that can test the students. You can do case-based learning. So you present cases in the simulator itself and you can go through the cases with the students, see if they can integrate those images. It can be self-directed, so like that laptop, it can go with them to the beach or go with them to the library and they can use it on their own time. It's very interactive in that you have to select um, decisions. It's like those Encyclopedia Brown books from way back when. So, you know, as you make decisions, things happen to your patient and you can see in real time the thing that, uh, the, decision, the effects of the decisions that you've made. And of course, it has testing capacity and speaking to a group of educators, I think there's a lot of potential here with the testing capacity um, that can uh, help with that, that um, uh, field and, and making the evidence available that was talked about before. Okay, 
Now, the other thing I think that's really interesting about um, some of the technology advances in ultrasound is that the images that we're generating are digital. And so same way that uh, um, mammograms have used uh, decision support software to augment new users and mentor new users through uh, interpretive algorithms, we can do the same thing with ultrasound. We just haven't done it as much yet. And I was very interested to hear earlier um, the uh, endometrial assessments. I think a lot of the ultrasound um, decisions that we make are, are very um, amenable to this kind of decision support. And so what we've done um, in Boston is we've taken um, the lung ultrasound findings, and many of you in the room know that when the lung ultrasound or when the lung is aerated, there are no um, uh, sound can't penetrate deep to the pleura, and so you get a reverberation artifact that shows up as what we call A-lines. And the challenge with lung ultrasound has been it's a paradigm shift. And so getting people to uh, adopt it is sometimes very challenging because they're so used to the chest x-ray, they're so used to their other testing, that getting them to believe that these findings have real clinical application can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. The other thing is when there is fluid in the lungs, you can see we have these then vertical lines that come from the pleura. What happens then is that, that there is a subjective interpretation of how much of that fluid is in the lungs. And so what, not me, but smarter people than me at MIT can do is they can quantify that m amount of artifact and count those number of B lines, and then they can give you an, a number. So imagine a device where you have your, and this could be for any application, this is not just for lung, but this could be for the endometrial uh, biopsy application or any of these applications. You have a device that walks the new user through the algorithm. So they select the area they're interested in, they select the different zones so they have to know where to put the probe, then they uh, you do their ultrasound, and the ultrasound is then quantified by that machine to give you a number. And you know, the number is sort of arbitrary, but you can pick a number four for a lot of beelines. And then that machine could count up all those numbers and add them up for that new user. And I think what that does is it gives an access to a new user and some sort of objective number that they can now apply to their patients. And I think this type of technology is going just around the corner for ultrasound because I think there's a lot of applications like this where decision support and help in interpreting um, can be applied to the medical applications and will expand the number of users. Just like was mentioned earlier, you know, this is something that can be used by the pre-hospital emergency medicine technician who's, who is working in the field who needs to know whether they give Lasix or they give albuterol. Okay. The other thing I think is really important about ultrasound um, and in terms of the paradigm of educational learning is not just that there are good simulators and there's decision support and that there's computer algorithms that can be supported for this, is that really it brings, not only is it something that patients enjoy because it brings the, pa the doctor back to the bedside, but it's something that the students enjoy because it brings the teacher off the podium and back to the bedside and teaching the student one-on-one. -on -one. And I think many in the room, I see lots of nodding, you have had that experience where you're standing at, at a machine, there's three or four of you around a patient, and not only are you teaching them how to use the machine, you're discussing medicine, you're discussing the case, you're discussing the findings, how would you use these findings in a certain patient, what do you do in your practice, what do you do in your practice, and so there's a lot of exchange and a lot of mentoring that happens with this education that I think is very valuable, and it's the type of thing that medical schools have been trying to get back into the medical education by doing these small groups, but it makes it very real because the physiology and the pathology and the pathophysiology are right in front of you. So you can discuss this one-on-one -on -one with the students. And this is an event um, called the Sono Games. I, I don't know if people in the audience, except for the emergency physicians, have heard of this, but there's a, um, or, a SAEM, which was our academic emergency medicine organization, organized two years ago the first Sono Games. And uh, medical school or uh, residency programs from around the country would submit it, have a team, and then that team would be put through a number of procedures and diagnostic challenges and scanning challenges, but they would also have to use those findings to integrate into how would they make clinical decisions for their patients, and it has become a huge success because, first of all, the students are with the um, leaders in the field, and so people they've seen published in papers and published um, in their journals and heard them lecture, but they're at the bedside competing with the other students. It's a very fun-filled event, and it's the type of thing that I think could happen at medical schools as well. It doesn't have to just be emergency medicine centers. 
centric, you could have a physiology scan off or an anatomy identification competition. And it makes it very fun and very interactive, and it's been a huge success. Um, the other thing is that uh, remote mentoring, whoops. Um, so remote mentoring, I think, is something that is um, also possible with ultrasound. Uh, this is my sister's family, and I, I apologize to Peter. Peter always gets picked out for this. But Peter is of the generation, as it was spoken before, that absolutely is going to use technology for every aspect of his life. And his babysitter, Miss Tina, is 16 years old, and he thinks she's a genius because if she doesn't know anything, she just asks her phone. And I think there is something in that that's really important for medical education. And one of the things I think that's really important there is that you have access to information now with the web and with your phone that you never had before at the bedside. And of course, we still have to teach the cognitive ability to, to discern which is good information, which is not good information. And so that's something that comes with mentoring. But that information is going to be there regardless of whether we filter it or not. And so I think we can use that to our advantage. So here. This is a, a study we did. We had people from different parts of the world transmit their images to us in Boston using different types of wireless transmission. So 3G, Wi-Fi, Skype, um, you know, all different kinds of transmission. And you can see, even though there's different qualities in each of these scans, and some of the scans are a little more pixelated, and some of them are a little fuzzy, this is something that is incredibly powerful. If I'm sitting in my office in Boston, and I can get a Wi-Fi image transmitted to me from millions of miles away in a remote clinic in Rwanda where we've done some training, I can give real-time feedback on what does that image show, what should you do to change to get a better image, and that kind of remote mentoring has never been possible before, I think, until th this digital revolution happened where machines that were cheap and had decent quality could be put in the hands of clinicians around the world. So I think ultrasound has an incredible potential for mentoring within you know, the medical school system here in the USA in terms of bringing the, uh, the teacher back to the bedside, but it also has an incredible potential internationally and worldwide in that experts can be made available to people around the globe where they can give information and, and, and mentor people through the image acquisition and interpretation stage, and also in clinical decision making. I have a, a story of someone who sent us a picture. You know, They knew what it was. They knew what the, the finding was and what the diagnosis was, but they actually wanted help in, in deciding what to do for that patient next. So I think there's a huge um, a, a array of possibilities here. Um, so again, I think one of the interesting and kind of exciting things, and hopefully some of this excitement will come across in the next three days, but the people who like this type of disruptive technology tend to be um, innovators and think outside the box. And so... Um, So there's a concept called FOMED, which is a free open access medicational, medica um, medical education. And I don't know if any of you are Twitterers or tweeters or whatever the noun is of, in the audience. I'm very new to this. And so um, you know, when I started doing this, I, I was just kind of following along with different things. But the hashtag and the free open access um, hashtag means that now people can search for exciting applications or educational lectures or research or, or um, even just a cool video of an interesting finding. And you can search for that through the Twitter application. And I really think that um, point of care ultrasound has taken advantage of this in a big way. Um, and I'm going to show you um, three of my friends here. So these are three um, uh, podcast uh, and online learning applications. But they have an incredible uh, um, range, and I think they have an incredible access. Um, Mike Stone, who does a lot of teaching and a lot of online lectures, has 40,000 visits to his site where they've downloaded his lectures over you know, 100,000 times. He is, is 120 countries have accessed his site, and he gets weekly um, tweets, I guess you say, weekly tweets from people um, as they're asking him about different cases or about different things. He told me a really cool story in that he's now mentored a rheumatologist in remote Norway through get, learning how to do a posterior tibial block so he can uh, get, treat his patients with plantar fasciitis, and he's never met the man. <laughs> and that's an incredible opportunity. I mean, there's an incredible opportunity here to 
provide education. Sona Spot is another um, uh, group. They have um, also an amazing array of lectures and online applications. Um, they have over 100,000 visitors. Um, they, again, have a huge array of international countries that have downloaded from their site. And um, I don't know what real followers are, but I guess that means that they interact more on Twitter um, than other people. And of course, Ultrasound Podcast, hopefully many of you have heard of this. This is sort of the original um, FOMED concept. Um, 400,000 visitors to their site. I mean, that's almost half a million people have seen their podcasts. Um, they basically get 30,000 people to their site a month. And imagine that range of access if, you know, for the educators and, and people who are here from different medical schools. I can almost promise you that 30,000 people a month are not clicking on the homepage for, let's say, Harvard University um, Medical School. And so it's an incredible array of access to education, to um, potential uh, students, to people who want to learn. And again, I think the, the content is, is very high quality, and which is what promotes um, that uh, that following, but I think this free open access concept has been something that's really revolutionized not just ultrasound but also medical education. Um, so the true test of any tool is how it's going to be used, and I think uh, uh, ultrasound, as has been discussed today, but also as will be discussed in many of the other lectures, has an enormous potential because one, it can help with just basic medical education, so learning the basics of anatomy, learning the basics of physiology. Um, it has the potential for decision support in a way that a lot of Im diagnostic imaging does, but we haven't taken advantage of that to this time. So I think there's a lot of potential there to help mentor new users through decision support to feel more comfortable with the technology and more comfortable with the findings. Um, I think it is an incredible mentoring uh, opportunity. Um, it brings the teacher back to the bedside. Um, and uh, I think there's also opportunities with a lot of these simulators um, for doing assessments, which I know um, is very important, obviously, if we're going to prove that, that this technology adds something to the medical education experience. Um, and I think that is it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.